So for years I lived down there and um, we pushed and pushed and pushed and it just didn't work. And I knew why. You know, and then you weren't country. What is country now? Caswell Cook and welcome to the first Caswell Cook show in like 10 years. It's just crazy. We used to do this show starting back in 1995 and, um, and, and then we just stopped doing it. And so years later, we called up our friend Billy Gilman and said, would you be the first guest? Would you be the guinea pig for the next Caswell Cook show? The mm -hmm. Caswell Cook show 2.0. 2.0. That is debuting in January, although this is a preview episode. So Billy, thank like you it. for my being pleasure, here on the friend, Caswell Cook pleasure. show. Um, we've never met before. We're just doing this straight off. No. <laughs> so you you have this amazing career because you were born in 1988. I read Wikipedia, and uh, right. There's a song out there in the 80s. Be careful what you read. <laughs> <laughs> he was born approximately 1988, and in 2000, when you were like 11, 12 years old, all of a sudden you had a number one album, One Voice, and you had this huge single. In fact, I think you had three singles off that album. What did you? What were the songs on that first record? One Voice. Uh, it was One Voice, Oklahoma, and da -da 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 -da. I gotta rewind. <laughs> There's a hero. There's a hero. And all of a sudden, you are this huge star. You're, you're getting like nominations for Grammys. You sold two million records of your first album. And then you went gold with other albums. It's crazy. So how does a person uh, who's like 11 years old get a record? And, and then get a number one record? And then, and then be like the superstar? Like, how does that happen? I mean, it's all, I mean, I will say a little bit is talent, a little bit is timing, a little bit of is, if it's luck, um, and I'm grateful to have and to have had it at all. Um, yeah, so funny enough, fast forward a second, that makes sense for the past, my, um, when that was I was good, when I was, when it's back to the future, um, again, 2.0. <laughs> When I was doing The Voice, they wanted a lot of B-roll of like me growing up, my, my young career. So there was a lot of stuff that my parents had to like dig out of their home movies. And we found one of me sitting in the kitchen at 18 months old, humming and singing along to the Jeopardy theme. So it was, it was always there. Right. Um, so I, I was always singing in school for show and tell. I'd bring in a little microphone and sing instead of bringing up my favorite dinosaur car thing, you know animation thing. See that Fisher Price thing? Fisher was, Price. Yeah. I would have this little karaoke yeah. machine and when the teacher would see me toting it, they, every Friday she'd be like, oh God. Um, look who's talking now. She, no. <laughs> she was since <laughs> No, she go. was actually great. Mrs. Pierce, I remember her. <laughs> um, so I, singing was always, you know, yeah. so um, against the well wishes of my parents, or not so, not so well wishes, being in a small town, they just read the rags and it's all negative. So they were frightened at the thought of their child wanting to sing. And I was like adamant, I want to sing, I want to sing. So my grandmother secretly um, took me to a voice coach uh, in Westerly, happened to be Westerly's own Angela Bakari, who is still in my career now after 20 some odd years. And at seven, eight years old, we started, you know, learning pitch and learning little tricks and how to hold long notes. And then she started to teach me how to move on stage and what you do. And then through her contacts with local agents, we were working Massachusetts area, Connecticut, of course, Rhode Island. And that uh, got the, um, you know, it caught wind in the attention of Greg Piccolo. Some Grammy fairly known uh, legend. Room full of blues. <laughs> yep, a fantastic saxophone player who actually did a solo on my uh, third record with Sony, Dare to Dream. He flew. He, I don't know if he flew in or if he recorded it at home, but whatever. Wow. He uh, became a part of my life and my career and sent a demo tape off to this very legendary country band, Asleep at the Wheel. Uh, flew down to Texas after they heard me and we did a demo. And then they. You know, the ties that bind, you know, they asked me to perform at the Wild Horse Saloon in Nashville. They were doing a show 
And looking back, it was kind of like a showcase because I didn't know there were record people in the audience. And then Sony was in the audience and they became my home for quite a few years. And then I was with them for months and months. I was signed in September, October of 99 and June of 11. I mean, June of two, June of 11. Yeah, we, 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 we waited a long time to release Decade. that record. Yeah, it took 10 years. Um, June of 2000 was when One Voice was, was released. And your life changed right away? Um, it, it changed even before then. Because the groundswell of support from the local area was insane. We want him here, we want him there, and then it started to stretch. And I was flunking class, I was not a very good academic person anyway. Uh, not my thing. Sorry all my teachers that are watching this, if you are. I love you people, but I didn't like what you were teaching. Um, <laughs> disclaimer. <laughs> Um, I was just tough. It just didn't. I didn't. It wasn't for me, right? Well, Even so though I had to do it. It wasn't. But you're. But you're like on the road. You're doing shows. So how do you do school? So honestly, what the formula was, I'd get up at like one or two in the afternoon, have a bite to eat. He still does that. No, no, no. <laughs> Seven a.m. Um, four four a.m. This morning, I had media interviews and whatnot. Um, so you, I get up, have some whatever to eat take a shower, do my sound check, do whatever I have to sign, or I have to do a radio remote, and then I would um, do the preliminary meet and greet for the people that won an audience contest or a radio contest or meet and greet VIP, do my concert, and then I would go out every night, still to this day, and sign autographs for as many people that wait around. Sometimes it can be three hours, it can go till 2.30 in the morning. I'd get on the bus, put my pajamas on, and do my schoolwork. <laughs> So it was, why do I need it, right? Now yeah. you get what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you always need your academics, kids. School before a career. What? Um, Except in his case. <laughs> so yeah, it was, but it was tough because it was one-on-one -on -one and not liking academics. It was tough. You can't go anywhere. You can't go, can I go to the bathroom? And just hang out for a minute, see a friend, right, roam no. the halls. You're one on one, and it was it was tough, but we we did it, and it was you know you know Angela. I probably gave her all the gray hairs that she had because she, you know, if I if she wasn't around, I have a younger brother. I don't see any gray hairs on her now. It's very expensive dye. Um, <laughs> it looks good. It's one time only. Um, she put it in at fifty, and it's stayed. That's good. Um. <laughs> Don't worry, you're gonna need it someday, right? I already do. <laughs> Shh. You're too young. I'm for young. That. I'm young. I'm still young. Um, my doctor said so anyway. Uh, so because of her, you know, my parents were not gonna leave their normality. I have a younger brother, and I said to them, I don't want him leaving school. It's not fair. He didn't choose this. So she literally became my my second mother. So she was overseeing everything, and I have a, I had a tutor back home that would go through the, with the curriculum, and they'd be like. He's got to be this. He's getting cheat code to me, Billy. And here I am doing this 25,000 C place. Got to do your, write your book report. What? <laughs> you know, it was, it got hairy sometimes on the road, but we survived. We survived. But it was, it was really tough. It was m way more difficult than people would realize. I grew up with country music. Forever will love it. And I am so gra grateful for the opportunities that it gave me. But I knew my voice, even back then, was doing things on the outside that I know wouldn't be accepted on the inside. Right. Um, I would do my shows and do what was asked of me and do this formula, and then I would get on the tour bus or the dressing room and I would belt out these songs that would totally not fit it. So it was it was a it was like a it, it was like a, a pure Gemini, you know, two sides, you know what I mean? And um, so I went to Nashville. I, I I gave in and said, okay, I want to do that. Learn the studio, know how to produce my own stuff, know how to engineer. Uh, know how to song write, what makes a great songwriter, mm -hmm. how long that takes. So for years I lived down there and um, we pushed and pushed and pushed and it just didn't work. And I knew why. You know, and then you weren't country. What is country now? It's a lot of stuff. But back then, even as long as short as that is, I mean that's not a lot of years ago. Eight, you know, that doesn't I mean that is a lot of time in the music business, but not really in the bigger scheme of things. I mean, I was sitting in one label office and the, and the man said, well, we just don't want our men sounding like Carrie Underwood. And I thought, that's the biggest asset. That's the coolest thing. Right. They, you know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't get it then. Right. Um, so I really knew in my head that I have to start to move on. 
how I had no idea because I wasn't in that field and, and some other field in country. Country was my roots. Those fans are my root. Like everything was familiar, but it just wasn't working. Right. Oh, hey. <laughs> This is Casual Cook, as you probably know because you're on my YouTube page or you're watching the show. But the only reason we have a new Casual Cook show is because of the four sponsors that are making it possible, making this pilot episode, this first episode in a decade possible. Four wonderful sponsors. You know, I don't think it's often that a person who's doing a TV show actually knows the people who are sponsoring personally. And one of the things that's making the Casual Cook Show so awesome is that the four sponsors that are making this happen are all people that I use for whatever their services are. So Thorpe and Trainer Insurance has been around since 1910. I've known Howie Thorpe since I was a kid growing up at church and we are just part of the same community and Thorpe and Trainer is a fabric of our community. and. I get my insurance through Thorpe and Trainer. Um, DNV Mechanical, uh, they are awesome. They do uh, uh, ducted and ductless air conditioning, heating, um, commercial appliance repair, things like that. And I always call Frank um, anytime something goes wrong at my restaurant, he comes down and he fixes it. And so, like, just he's awesome, DNV Mechanical. The other person that's sponsoring is uh, Dunn's Corner Chiropractic. I've been going to Dr. Campbell since. Well, 1999, so for 20 years I've gone to him, and whenever I've had an issue, or even when I don't have an issue, I get checked up by him. I swear by chiropractic care, and the best chiropractor around is Dr. Campbell, and he's right in Dunn's Corners across the street from Walmart. Um, 322-8822 is his phone number, and I recommend Dr. Campbell highly. He's worked on me, my wife, my children, and he's done a great job. Um, and the last one is Seaside Pharmacy, Bill Quirk. So here's a guy that, that went against the odds and opened up an independent small business uh, drugstore in Westerly, a pharmacy in Westerly. I'm old fashioned by saying drugstore, but you know what I mean. And Seaside Pharmacy is located right near Applebee's. It's up in Dunn's Corners. Um, and you just get personal service. You, like, you walk in there and like they know your name. They know what you're coming there for. They don't have to ask you, you know, all these questions about who you are because they know you. It's kind of like the cheers of pharmacies. But Bill's really cool and he, he makes things happen and he's a big community supporter. So those are the four sponsors that honestly are responsible for making the Caswell Cook Show fly again in 2020. So in that fight and in that, in that really dark time, because I really had no idea, uh, the voice called um, and Angela, again, called me on the phone and said, so the voice show called, no, click, she knew, okay, I'm going to back away from this. Another couple months went by, another season of the voice called, I don't want to do it, click, okay, we'll let it go. They called four times. And the fifth time, or what, fourth or fifth time, she says, you know, the voice called. And I went silent. She goes, Ooh, maybe a light went off. And it did, because I thought to myself, you know, I've had wonderful opportunities, big opportunities that I went, eh, on, and they go away. And then you regret. That's, right. a, that's a regret, you know. But this one kept coming back, coming back, coming back. So I said, no opportunity this massive has ever kept coming back, no matter if I like it or not. Mm. I said, what a great opportunity to be thrusted if it were to happen into this category where I can just sing. It's the best formula for me to just stand there and sing. I don't have to pretend what is, what was, what is gonna be, I can just do my thing. So I had many meetings with past managers and record label executives. I, wa I wanted everyone's feedback before I jumped in because I didn't know if they were gonna turn around and make a joke you just don't know. Yeah, right, right. So all these thoughts were going in my head, and I said, well, if I'm going to do this show, I have to really just get out there and wail and, and do me. Because if I'm trying to be something, America will sniff that out immediately. America is very smart like that. And so, luckily, it worked. And I stepped out on that stage scared to death, because finally, for the first time, I was at the, at the helm of the ship. What's it like in that room? Like, I mean, how big is the audience? Like, I mean, the lights are on you. Is there like a big gulf between you and where everybody's sitting? Like, how does it feel when you walk out in that in that place? It's tiny. I'm trying to think of a of a example. Um, I don't know. What theater? I mean, we, all, we all see it through. Yeah, the vets. Like, no, no, it's way anything? smaller than the vets. See? Oh yeah, there was only 480 seats. Oh, really? It just looks so big. It's because it it, it, it's tall. Yeah. It's very, uh, very tall, so it looks like the coaches are maybe from here, 
to the piano, so maybe, I don't know, maybe to the corner of the wall away, um, 40 feet, 50 feet, um, but it's big, like you're high up and they're a little low, so it's like, I, mysteries, you know, I, and there's a little, band, there's a band behind us, which you got to practice with, I hope, yeah, for, we, I think we practiced for two weeks before the, the, sh the show, so it was like maybe four times, because at that point, there's hundreds of contestants, you know, you, you gotta wait your turn, and I'm not good at that. <laughs> I was like, man, I've already had a record. <laughs> Which was tough, because everyone was like, why is he here? Get him off the show. Because they thought you were a professional. So not only did are. I have to fight to, for America, but I had to fight in the background, too. It was, it was crazy. What, was, what, was, what did you feel like when you got done with the first song in front of the audience with the judges? What was that like? Was it vindication? Was it... What was it for you? Oh yeah, it was total. It was total vindication. But I knew that okay, I have a, I have my work set for me now because there are gonna be, there's gonna be people that want to see me succeed, and there's gonna be people that want to see me fail, and it's my job to convince the, the people that want to see me fail that you know. I'm well, just no just one worried. in your home state wanted to see you. No, fail. but you know, there's a way, no, and I, I know I had to convince people that I'm just as worthy as the guy that's bussing tables. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? So how do you pick, who picks the songs you, I mean, my way you did, I mean, how do, how do you arrive at the songs you're going to sing those nights? So um, after you do the audition, the, the coach runs to you and your family and he's, they talk to you for a minute and welcome to the team, welcome to the voice family, blah, 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 blah. And um, Adam says, we have our work to do. I went, yep, sure. <laughs> so I kept my mouth shut and we met behind closed doors and I said, I know what I need to do. Just can you, will you let me do what I need to do? And he, he sat back and he went, sure. The only song I did not choose myself was um, Man in the Mirror. It almost killed me. And that, my was a, that was a duet, right? That was a duet. Yeah. And I knew it was Adam teaching a lesson. I, because I'm singing these beautiful ballads and here I'm struck with this such a rhythmic, you have to be in the pocket kind of thing. And he teams me up with someone that's so in the pocket. And I'm like, oh, this is like oil and water. Like, it's like such night and day. And it stuck out. And I was like the low part. Like, I was like the one that's dragging. So, and everyone had like, um, okay. So, I don't know if this was, I, I doubt it was all on purpose directed towards me. Because there's, I'm not the only person on this team. But it just, it just felt so odd. Because, okay. There were, it was, the only two people out of like 10 artists on his team they were all R&B rockish, okay? There was only one, there was only like two people on our team that stuck out, me, Pretty Boy Pop, <laughs> and another guy. You, you, you heard it first here on the Caswell Cook Show. <laughs> Pretty Boy Pop, it's well, a new genre. Well, I mean, it's, being honest. Uh, me singing these la 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 when we were young. Yeah. And then a guy was singing Michael Buble. We were the only two, and what, who does he pick for, what does he pick for me? A rock R&B song, and what's, who's my advisor? Sammy Hagar. That works. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's not gonna get me. This is like being back at Nashville with that record producer, that record guy. Um, and it was pointed out numerous times. I mean, I don't know if it's on YouTube, I don't know what's on TV or Hulu or whatever you can watch back when. I don't even know if they're there anymore. But you can watch the, the judging. It was tough. And I just kept going, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm done. I'm, it's so blatantly obvious that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna succeed in this. I was a I was literally meltdown case because I'm like, all right, I didn't think they turned for the audition. I can't, but I, when you physically can't get something, no matter how hard you try, everyone has their limitations. You know, that's just the way it does, especially musically. If you can't do something, you can only go so far. Otherwise, a rap guy could be opera. No, he has his limitations. Right. But those, all, but he has a strength that I don't have. So I stayed up the be right the, the night before the actual taping, I was up till 4.30 in the morning, listening to the, I, and I said to Adam and the, produ and the um, musical director, uh, Paul, I said, just give me nothing but the piano and all the congas, drums, all the drum, I just want the drum, I just want the drum. So I was just, it was just in my head, in my head, in my head. And um, I got up on the stage and I threw my hands up in the air and I went, okay, here we go. And, that was, that was the biggest feat for me in that whole show. That was the biggest, that was the toughest, most grueling part of the show was the battle round. Mm -hmm. And then what about the song that Adam wrote that you sang? Mm. Actually, pardon me, I don't know if he wrote it. 
but it was supposed to be it was on his. Supposed to be a Maroon Five song. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a song. He couldn't find one. I gave him a couple that I had written, and um, he liked them. But it just he wanted something different, completely different. So everyone else had their song, and I had no song. Two days before the live finale, I had no song, and okay. So he calls me at one o'clock in the morning. He goes, "I've got a song. I want to give it to you." Maroon, the band just passed on it. Uh, it was going to go on this last record, but here. And obviously it was called Because of Me. And I love it. And I still do it in my show to this day. Speaking of shows to this day, how many shows do you do in a year? I mean, is this, are you like always out or are you? It varies. Um, last year was very busy. 2017, I did, I think, 90 shows. This year, let the, the middle to end of last year was not that busy. I did quite a few Christmas dates uh, because I'm not the kind of artist that can write and record during that process. My mind doesn't go there. Like I, like the Hunter Hayes and the Shawn Mendes of the world, like hats off to them to be able to b bounce it like right. that. If I'm writing, it's literally a 20 hour day. Well, I can't go on stage, I'm fried. Mm. Mentally singing, you know. So I have to shut it off. So I will take time to go, to, like I record in LA and, and, and um, Burbank, and I'll be there for months recording, creating, because the, the, all the songs will start from the ground up, the sounds. I mean, to get like the soldier song. Mm -hmm. um, there's like four sounds in there. Like the little, there's a little divot sound. Mm -mm. It took four hours just to get that one sound the way I wanted it. So it's like such a long, drawn out thing that I can't sing and do concerts at the same time. I'm just not there. So um, it's been, I've been pulling back on the shows next year. Um, they've already got uh, February and March booked. There's a possible Asia tour. Um, there's, I think, an Austra a couple of Australia dates. So I think next year will be pretty When people go up. see you in concert, what are they gonna hear? They hear a journey. They, um, actually, I just did, recently just did a show and I always make sure to meet and greet, always. And if the, if the theater allows it or whatever. And this one person said, I've seen 13 of your shows. And I said, and I just new, newly formed this new show. I've only done it like 10 times. So this, this new show is brand new. And this girl said, you know, you, you, you let us in this time. And I went, well, what do you mean? She goes, I felt like I was a part of the journey now rather than being sung to. And I went, oh, okay. So I guess it's an open window to really my soul and where I want to go and what I want to do. And I'm happy that it's, it's perceived that way. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's all the music. I do a lot of stuff that I did on The Voice. Of course, I do my new songs. Um, I will always do one voice in Oklahoma and the songs that made me because there are many millions of people that remember them. Mm -hmm. And they're timeless. I'm lucky to have songs like that. I, I, what if I had I Want Candy? I wouldn't <laughs> do that at 50 years old. You know what I mean? <laughs> but luckily I have songs that I can sing yeah. at 40 years old and 50 years old and they still stand up and it doesn't sound odd. Right. Which is cool. Well, McCartney said, you know, when, when he was a young guy, he said, probably we'll write songs for a few more years, but no one's going to want us here sing hear us singing from me to you when we're 40 well all right so, that's you know, true so don't you know he's and, <laughs> and what was it that's jerry funny. seinfeld that roasted him in front of obama and he said she was just 17 you know what i mean no i don't because <laughs> now he's like almost 80. so you know, yeah, so you know these people i mean you, you, and you're so young to be able to say yeah well my first hit was 20 years ago i mean that you're what are you 30 yeah 30 31 30, yeah 31 so like you're lucky and then when you're like 80 you'll be like you'll be able to say 70 years ago my first hit was i hope so i hope i'm around that long <laughs> how do you how do you like take care of the voice now then your voice, not the voice, your voice. It's, it, I mean, it's it's a, a process. I had just gotten hit up to possibly do um, something that I don't know if, I don't know where my head is at to do it, but um, it would be a role on Broadway. And I'm so, I'm a firm believer that to truly deliver a song, it's to me, it's never the same way twice. When I'm in the moment and as an audience now, they could be a bored audience, they could be an intuit audience, they could be an old audience, a young audience. I'm gonna react differently. And you get bad, you get written up by directors, producers, choreographers, if you don't do it the same way, no matter what you're feeling, it's the same way every single night, eight shows a week. I don't know if I could do that, you know? Um, but I treat my voice, e even when I'm not performing, well, I'm always performing either 
benefits or concerts or recording. Like I'm, it, it's always used, but I treat it like I'm going out to perform a two-hour show every day. Every day I do an hour and 45 minutes of uh, warm-ups. Um, I swim to, for my diaphragm. I work out. I do a, a lot of Peloton biking exercises for the diaphragm. Um, and I do certain sprays and certain teas. Slippery Elm is my best friend. Um, I try not to drink vodka martinis, but they are my best friend. A um, couple packs of Marlboros. Oh yeah, I did that too in Nashville. Vaping. Figuring I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Everyone doesn't like this child star. I'm gonna start. Sm and I smoked Marlboro Reds really? for about really? six months, and I'm like, the hell am I doing? <laughs> I don't like this. What am I doing this for? Yeah, yeah. You thought that would make. Plus, I get dizzy, different. and I'm like, what is this? You, you sound like Keith Richards if you can. Yeah. Get <laughs> now there's. Talk somebody. about someone that does never. You know, after the whole. I you know after the uh, apocalypse. There'll be Cher and Cher, Keith, Richards, Keith Richards and cockroaches. cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm doing an old joke. <laughs> no, it's true. Maybe I've just seen his show so many times. <laughs> hey, he's iconic. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for talking to us on our first Casual Cook show oh, in all awesome. these years. It's What's really the trick good. questions, though? So before we began this, he was saying about trick questions. What's there a trick? Qu you said trick questions? Or is it with a joke? Uh... Oh, now I put him on the, his own show and I put him on the spot. This is the uh, Billy Gilman show. And so how long have you been doing this? Well, you know, since 1995, kid. Oh, really? You were only seven. That's right. I first came on the air in 95, and um, my first interview was this guy, Peter Wolf from the Jay Giles Band. Oh, yeah, of course. And he didn't know who I was. Obviously, I was this kid. And um, I said, well, I'm here to interview you. And he's like, I don't know. No. And so then I picked up all our equipment and started walking away. And he's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So we did this interview, and he said... Uh, uh, he goes, hey Kaz, he had the gravelly voice, with all the trouble in the world today, why doesn't it pay to write to Washington? And I'm like, I don't know, because he's dead, and he smacked me, and walked away. Oh, But wow. it was great, man, because yeah. I got smacked by the Jay Giles band, so wow. it was good, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. so anyway, That's but I, awesome. don't, I actually don't have a trick question. And then Conan O'Brien was one of our guests soon after that, and I knocked on his door because his mother lives in town. So I heard, yeah, 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 yeah I've heard and that. And he answered the door, and I said, I, I do this show. He goes, yeah, my mom watches it. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, well, can we have you come on the show? And he's like, sure. So we did that, and then after that, it just kind of, you know, then once, once you have like a few guests, that's it. and people are like, oh, I'll do it, you know? That's and then later on, I started booking all these people to perform, so then they kind of knew. So then I was like, well, why? I should interview these people that play. And by the way, I want to thank Billy because Two years ago was it? it was, I don't know when it was, but we had uh, the, the legendary John Caffrey and the Beaver Brown Band. Oh yeah, ready on the to, dark ready to side. Play. On the dark side, yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, <laughs> he got sick like two days before and he called and he's like, he really sounded bad. He goes, guys, I can't, I can't sing. Oh, that's what was wrong. I always wondered, I, yeah. I always had wondered what his, happened. His, his doctor said, you sing, you're not singing again. So you can't oh, sing. I've been there. So then, uh, I don't know how it happened, but you talked to Angela. Angela sent me a Facebook message. Yeah, we were in message. Oregon. Yeah. And yes. this guy flew back and saved the day and brought a huge crowd down to Musquamish. That crowd was fun. Like, cr certain crowds, you know, I like I say, I, I did like six before that. I can't remember them. But... That, I hope that doesn't go naturally. I remember you. I love you. <laughs> you can't, if you can't please everybody. So you got to please yourself. Yeah. No. Oh. Um. <laughs> See, now I found a song that's from before his time. Garden but, um, Party. Oh, there you go. You should do that one. I got to I got to listen to it. Yeah. But anyway, that crowd that that night, it was foggy. It was like kind of eh. He would have been really all messed up if he sang in that weather. It was such a great, lively crowd. Angela came on stage. We did a duet. It was that crowd was amazing. That was a fun crowd. So thank you. The, the most amazing thing about it was that he actually did Cafferty's whole set. Start I did. To finish. So he was doing Dark Side, Tender Years. I mean, he was Cafferty. I'm joking. He really didn't. He actually sang his own songs. <laughs> and anyone that's watching can attest that I did my own song. We may even have some footage of that. Not so. I Want Candy. <laughs> I want candy. They did one song. One song pushed Bow, me. Wow, wow, wow. That's who sang that, right? Yippee-o, oh, yippee-a? Eh? No, I Want Candy. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That was the trick question. Who sang I Want Candy? Someone in my younger years. You know who it was? Oh! Oh, that... That uh, she redid it. Uh, I think it was a guy. Uh, 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 no, no, it was that. It was that, in my 2000 era yeah, that someone it was in did the it. Yeah, 2000 era. Yeah. 
I yeah. didn't want to say Mandy Moore. But yeah, it was one of those. Was hey, yeah, Google. Yeah, one of those people. Yeah, yeah, one of those people. Do you ever hear yourself on like Sirius or when you're listening to a decade channel? Do you come on? Thank God, no. Oh, good. And I just was on. I, so I've been guests uh, every time that I'm home for any kind of like week or whatever. If the radio station 92 Pro FM gets wind of it, they'll say, "Do you want a guest a guest host?" Because they get they love it and they get a lot of great feedback on it. And I'm honored that people like listening to me on the radio like that. And it's a fun dynamic and a different dimension to my career. And I'm just like, sure. Um, and so you sit there between songs, you're waiting, you know, to go back on the air. So I'm just on MSN, and it was something about I don't know what it said. It was a headline of something. And my name scrolled through, and for once they didn't use former child star. They just used Billy Gilman, and I went, yes! So that was even nice, because it wasn't categorizing it in a generation form. Right. So, but no, I don't, I don't hear myself. I've heard pe people tweet me and go, I just heard you on such and such, but I don't ever catch it. That's the Which question. Which is totally fine. That's the question I want to ask you. So you have, like, what, where are you on social media? Obviously, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I just signed on to TikTok. Someone advised me of my PR team to do TikTok. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. My so. nine-year-old daughter is doing What that. do you do? I have no idea, but she knows. She can consult. Okay. Well, she, <laughs> she wanted have her to, people call she her. Want, she wanted to meet you, but she's singing at Chorus of Westerly Practice right now. So. Well, that's better than meeting me. Right. Keep singing. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, um... Uh, what, what else? So TikTok, yeah. Uh, there's another one I just signed on to, and it's been like crazy. Ta it's like a full-time job on its own. So that's my question. You do your own social media. I have people that do it for me, especially if I'm in a long flight, like to here in LA, and it's like five hours flight, and something needs to happen, which has been the case. And I have two girls in New York on a on a firm that help me out and have all that. So sometimes it's most of the time it's me. Sometimes it's them. Cameo. That's that's the one. That one is fun. Like people will like randomly message you, and they and you get cleared. You know, it's a whole company that does right. it on behalf of artists, so it's not some wacko. Um, but what I'm sure there maybe can be. I don't know. Wackos, welcome to just <laughs> no stalking. And That's a whole nother show. I could fill up an hour just on that. Can you just give us before we go? Because now this is the Casual Cook Show extended hour. Um, can you just give us one like? Wacko story, like just like it is any pro. Give me something. There are so give many. Me, give me something. There was, there was a guy that would dress in drag, like you would have a blonde wig, a red wig, a brown wig, so he wouldn't be caught, and he would go to all the different shows. And there was another guy who said, "Now, mind you, I'm 15. Um, me, my father went crazy. He was a marine. No, my father sold oil with my grandparents in Woodmansey oil. So no, he was a marine. He went crazy. I'm trying to flee my." town in my life with this man and we're going to buy a house together in Colorado and called our hotel room in Las Vegas and said this is Billy Gilman's manager and Angela goes oh yeah then who the hell am I right it's nuts restraining orders like it goes on and on well, this is like the the because now that our, our buddy Taylor Swift lives here in Westerly yeah or sometimes yep uh, so a friend of mine was doing security and this guy said uh, he was her husband yeah it's just and, and he was there to you know pick her up for dinner it's scary, you know, because yeah. you just, so, but the thing is, like, what if these people have been around me and we didn't know it, like, until they started to strike? That's what I, you know, thinking back on it, I didn't know then, but looking back, I'm like, what if that person was in the diner that the bus stopped at and was around us, or followed it? Because we didn't have, you don't have the technology you have now. Right now, you do, and you then know, when you go to venues, you have security, and yeah, I mean, we always had security, but, you know. When you have 10,000 people, it's hard. Like, when you're in these arenas, no matter how good the security is, someone's getting away with something. Look at the Manchester arena with Ariana Grande. You mm -hmm. know there's security there, and the guy still got through. I know. You just never know. I know. Stuff happens. Anyway, it's it's an interesting life, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And the, la <laughs> the last question, then, is so... What? How much you were talking about, like doing Broadway, and you have to give the same performance, even if it's a lackluster audience. But how how much does it inspire you when you walk out and you hear that scream? Oh, that's what. That's the only reason I'm still alive. I probably would say I'll go to the depths of that. Not doing my job, but probably alive. Because when it's all you know, and it's you know that you have given. When someone stalls me. Um, be it a, a record head or this person going, I just don't know. When someone stalls this given gift, it, it, it's a factor of, of rage that I can't begin to understand. You're 
you're dealing with a you're dealing with something higher than myself. When you're saying no to what God gave me, that's a whole you're you're at you're setting the rhythm off. And it when I hear that audience, it just fuels me. And if I didn't have that, we'd have problems. So that is one of the major things in life that will always I will always be grateful for and strive to give the best I can because that's in the end that's any, that's all the artist has. Mm -hmm. You have your you have your music and your words and your thoughts, and then you have your audience. That's it. Everything else is you know. Expendable. Well, you have an amazing voice. I, I we we were like all watching you as was America. We were just like, how the hell do you sound that great? Like it is just. It, <laughs> and if sang... anyone wants to know, just call Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Booking now. Booking now. <laughs> She'll she, she, yeah, just <laughs> ask. You know, she was the literally she was the one. She uh, we we did. I can see. I can just keep going. We were doing a duet with Charlotte Church, who was an opera singer. I'm just gonna go to the restroom. I'll be back. Yeah. No, I'm just joking. You take it, Billy. Yeah. No. <laughs> so welcome to the Caswell Cook Show. I'm Caswell, and today we're with Angela Bacari, speaking on her legendary career. <laughs> he could do this. See now, if the music fails him, he could be a talk show. But you were t tell me this last story because I like it. Right. So you don't even know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see if you'd pick up on that. Um, I love this story. I just said I was with. <laughs> no, um, you mentioned the name. Charlotte Church in Maxine. London. And she was taught by the book with this teacher. And, she, and she's going in and she's telling her to do this. And I'm like, that is so wrong. Like she's going, you got to say B. Well, if I want to say B, I'm going to say B, right? So it's just certain placements of your tones. And like I said, Angela had such a long career herself. That she knew what happens if you have a fever, if you're hoarse, how to sing above it to don't damage it. And it's just years of experience. And those things just can't be taught by a book. So that creates longevity and being healthy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can't do crazy things. Which, as you know, I'm still learning not to do crazy things. <laughs> you wake up and you're hoarse. Well, you shouldn't have had those six vodkas, Billy. That's <laughs> uh, true. <laughs> we all have our. I, I could be Kathy Lee and Hoda's great pal. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> they drink wine at 11 a.m. That's great. <laughs> just, just Kidding. be careful when you when you need, when you need a drink to stabilize in the morning. Then, That's right. Then you know. I know. I'm like, how can they do this at 11 a.m.? <laughs> because it's a continuation. Yeah. So funny. But yeah, you just gotta maintain a healthy start lifestyle and. You know, it comes out if you treat it well. Now, since we have this huge audience that's going to watch us, yeah. well, especially once you share the show on your Facebook page. Huh. But Hopefully. We, <laughs> what? <laughs> you never know. You never know. It could be good. He's got to see the edited version after. <laughs> but if there's one person out there that you could work with, that, mm -hmm. like, you know, whoever it is, like a superstar you've never met, whatever, who would you like to work with? Um... She can answer. Besides Angela. No, no, no. Not. <laughs> um, it would be... It would be two people. I'm trying to think of male and female to give it A and, a and B. Um, definitely female would be Streisand. That's the given. And B, uh, uh, for male, I honestly think it would be... I think it would be Justin Timberlake. I think him and I could create some really neat things. Wow, JT, if you listen to that, here's another man of the woods. Is he moving to Rhode Island? No, unfortunately, <laughs> but it's like... Those two people I would I would kill. To, I, that would be a moment. I could picture you redoing Guilty with Barbara Streisand. Right? You could, <laughs> you could do Barry's part, yeah. <laughs> He's a BG. How do you like that? It's kismet. Yeah, Barry Gibb. He's part of the BG army, right? <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, see you next time. <laughs>